Okay. So now I think we can uh, start the meeting properly. So tonight uh, we're going to do a few notices. Then we've got a news item from Len Mann, and I'll be handing over to Len as host for that section. And then uh, we'll be handing over to Simon Kidd for the main presentation tonight. And finally, we'll have Richard doing um, a planetarium presentation. And uh, that should wind it up. Uh, just a few notices. We are recording this, uh, so you just be aware of that. And uh, if you want to uh, invoke the speaker view, that's by clicking up on the top right hand corner, you see gallery and speaker view. That way you see the presentation and a small thumbnail of the speaker. And that's actually the best way I think to, to view that. But it's entirely your choice. Um, you can ask questions at any time using the chat button, but we won't actually be answering them until the very end uh, of, the, of the presentation. But if you think of something, you know, please do uh, go ahead and um, put it in. And then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our next meeting. <clears throat> our next meeting is on the 11th of December, and it's going to be a members images meeting. So we're going to have uh, basically those that were left over from the meeting in May. And we've got a selection of um, pictures from uh, various people, Martin Weston, uh, Bob Garner. Uh, uh, we'd like to pay a tribute to Bob as well. Um, David Hepwood and Peter Rees. Uh, so Stephen Helsinger's pictures here. So these are just some of the pictures that we've got in this. And at this point in time now, I'm going to hand over to Len for the news item. Are we alone? Uh... Is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? Well, this is quite a deep question for a five minute uh, news item, but um, I think you'll see what I'm getting at in a minute. I think this is a question that fascinates most of us. Uh, I'm definitely a person it fascinates. And um, yeah, I think it's something most of us do think about. Oh, there we go. So uh, many people have tried to answer this question, including Frank Drake with the famous Drake equation, which tries to find the probability of making contact with intelligent life, uh, extraterrestrial extra intelligent life. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to dwell on this equation. Um, when it was first conceived, many of the parameters in this equation were complete guesses. But there is an area where, uh, well, there's a few areas actually, but there's one area I want to talk about where we have got a lot more information now than we used to have. Um, and that is how many habitable worlds are there like the earth? Is this something we can shed light upon? So uh, a habitable planet, of course, is one that orbits its star in just the right position. It's, even, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. And then, <clears throat> of course, it needs to be the, the right sort of size. It can't be too different from the size of the Earth. Now, I'm being a bit presumptuous there because there could be life in many different habitats. But if we're looking for life, intelligent life, one place we know it's likely to be is an Earth, is a planet like the Earth uh, in the habitable zone. That's why um, I've concentrated on this. Oops. So um, before 1992, we had no knowledge of any planets outside of our solar system. We could only guess at how many they, they were, there, were there. And in fact, if any star other than our own had planets at all. Then we used uh, space telescopes to um, well, land-based telescopes to start with, then space te telescopes to detect exoplanets. They looked for transits where planets were slightly reduced, their, their light output was slightly reduced by stars going in front of them, and they also looked at Doppler effects, where planets caused its star to wobble slightly, and we could tell by the change in frequency of out output of light from the star. So, when we first started doing this, we detected hot Jupiters. Um, that's very large planets like the planet Jupiter and above, um, uh, orbiting very, very close to their star. And, and at first it was a bit uh, disconcerting. We thought, 
hello, we're, we're not really a, an average um, solar system. There's a lot of these planets, uh, hot Jupiter planets orbiting other stars. So we're not very typical. Um, <clears throat> but of course that was wrong. Um, it's just that hot Jupiters are the easiest to find. And in fact, um, uh, that, that misled us to think that. Um, <clears throat> the, the most notable exoplanet finding telescope was Kepler launched in 2009, operating until 2018. Kepler discovered over 4,000 exoplanets in our galaxy, and it was actually fixed on a very small portion of sky. So um, it did remarkably well. And then we had enough samples to use to statistically estimate the number of Earth-like planets in our galaxy. And several years ago, uh, an answer came up that there were 1 billion potential Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. Now, I was really encouraged by this because the latest figures on the number of galaxies in the visible universe is 200 billion. So to find the number of potential Earths, you multiply 1 billion by 200 billion, and you get an enormous number, which would mean that the chances of intelligent life elsewhere could be extremely high. Obviously, it depends on a number of other factors, but uh, that's how it came over to me. Right, now for the actual news. Um, a team led by Steve Bryson at NASA's Ames Research Center has reanalyzed, uh, have reanalyzed the Kepler data. They concentrated on stars the same size roughly as our sun. And they found that uh, statistically, 50% of sun-like stars have at least one rocky planet in the habitable zone. They only included planets of the diameter of half the diameter of Earth up to one and a half diameter of the Earth. And uh, they also focused on stars of a similar age and temperature to our sun. So it was an extensive study and the result is that the new estimate is that there are at least 5 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone, which is pretty amazing really, an increase of five. So we have to multiply 5 billion by 200 billion to see the number of potential Earth-like planets uh, in the visible universe. And that's not even including all the red dwarf stars of which we know there are planets in the habitable zone. It's just looking at main sequence stars. So I was very encouraged for this. So with all these numbers, my own opinion is that we are not alone in the universe. There, there are intelligent life forms out there. But the more relevant question now, of course, is how far away is the next civilization and will we ever be in contact with them? So that's the next question. Okay, and, and that ends the news. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Len. So just a quick word about our upcoming speaker, Simon Kidd. Um, Simon is a, an accomplished astrophotographer and you can see from the first picture up here, a picture of Jupiter and Callista. It it's, matches the quality of Damien Peach's pictures. And um, here's some other uh, pictures of Jupiter that he's taken more recently in 2018 uh, with um, uh, infrared, I believe as well. And um, here are some other planetary images he's taken. This one is of, of Saturn and um, a couple here of Mercury. And those that know about Mercury know that it's pretty hard to image. Uh, and finally, uh, he sent me this picture here, which I was quite amazed by. It's a picture of Mars, a recent picture. And that was taken, by, if you look at the date there, the 20th of September. And it's actually a very, very good picture. I believe that it's, uh, you know, it's up there with the best of them. And um, Simon doesn't know this, but I decided I would compare it to a, a better telescope. So I went and got a, a Hubble Space Telescope image. And you can see many of the features on Simon's uh, picture of Mars that are visible on the Hubble Space Telescope. For example, the Sinus Meridiani along here uh, over just on this side. And many of the other little features, if you look at these areas here, you can see these replicated here on Simon's picture. And I was quite surprised how good a quality picture that was from a, a Celestron a C14 on Earth. I, I mean, that is good. I know that Mars is um, pretty good at the moment or as it passed it, it's been good. But this uh, one from um, uh, the Hubble was taken in 2016. So yeah, 
Anyway, moving on, uh, talking about tonight's uh, topic, he's going to talk about asteroid occult occultations, I beg your pardon. And uh, really, uh, I'll leave it to Simon to, to, to talk you through uh, what this is all about. And uh, maybe he'll just um, give a short introduction to himself. Right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, can do. Right. I'll just get my views sorted out. Hold on. Right. There we are. Is that is that doing what it should? Yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, thanks very much, uh, Sean, for that like, nice introduction. And hello, everyone. Sorry about those hiccups there. It's all a bit new to me as well. Um, thanks for inviting me along. Um, I hope all is well for you uh, in, in lockdown. There's plenty more time to do observing, isn't there, uh, as long as the weather stays um, good, um, which I'm afraid it hasn't been in Hertfordshire today, where I am. It's been awfully misty, not suitable for observing uh, anything at all, I'm afraid but uh, never mind. Anyway, on to talking about asteroid occultations. Um, it's really something that I got into uh, whilst waiting for planets to appear, because mostly I, I do um, imaging of the planets and there wasn't much on. And I saw this advertised somewhere, this is quite a few years ago. And I thought, well, why not have a go? Um, it'd be something interesting. Um, I already had most of the equipment available. So it's just a question of getting getting up early one morning and uh, well I was um, surprised and pleased at what I saw it was uh, in fact very interesting more interesting than I thought and it sort of led from there really um, so uh, what, what I'll be talking about we'll, we'll outline what the events are to start with if you've never even considered what they might be we'll just go through the geometry of it all and what use these observations might be um, they do have a, a very Good use, actually. Uh, might surprise uh, some of you. Um, what gear you might need to make these observations if you're interested, and um, a look at my solution to trying to, in trying to make the uh, timings more accurate. Uh, that's the name of the game, really, is accuracy. I mean, in the past you could observe these with a telescope and a stopwatch, but um, I think those days are long gone. Uh, we're over to the uh, the, the methods of um, using video really to, to time these events. Um, so yes, trying to in, ensure best accuracy and also uh, a quick look at how the um, software available, which is usually free, um, is, is able to uh, analyze um, the results that you get to make uh, sure that the, the timings are statistically the, the best, um, the most likely outcome of what you observe because nothing's ever uh, absolutely clear cut, or hardly anything anyway. So let's get going. Um, what is an asteroid occultation? Um, well, in many ways, it's like uh, a total eclipse of the sun. Um, but instead of the sun, we have a star. And instead of the moon, we have an asteroid. And as the asteroid sweeps across the face of the star, which is actually a, an infinitely small point, as we all know, um, it does produce a shadow on the Earth, which moves across uh, fairly quickly. And anyone in that shadow will see the star disappear and reappear at the end of the event. You may be able to see the asteroid um, in the middle of the occultation. Uh, it depends how big the asteroid is, really, and how far away it is. Uh, but the whole thing may go completely dark um, it just depends. There's a big variation in what one might see on a particular event. Uh, not scale, no. <laughs> I'm sure we're all familiar with the rough scale of what we're talking about. Um, so the main asteroids that, that we look at, mainly because there are more of them uh, more easily seen, are in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. There are another family of asteroids uh, that uh, uh, follow Jupiter around or precede Jupiter, the Trojans, and also uh, not on this uh, diagram, um, a group known as TNOs, trans-Neptunian objects, which I'll be on Neptune, of course. Um, those are really very distant, but they do nonetheless um, occult stars and are certainly produce visible events from time to time. Uh, some of them very interesting. Okay. Uh, this was my very first observation, so I, I got up 
early one morning, um, from the time code, it looks like um, half past five in the morning, uh, 30th of September 2015, not knowing what uh, I would see, got my camera going, and it's the bottom star is the target. Now, with all these things, it's important to have a, um, a comparison star uh, because of cloud and various reasons that we'll look at later. Um, but the, the target star is the, at the bottom. So um, if I find my, where my cursor's gone and play the video, off it goes. So I was I'm looking away, not knowing what to expect. And it disappeared, completely disappeared. And this one was actually quite a large asteroid. So that follows that the, the time that it remained occulted was quite long. This is quite a, a long one, I would say. And also the dip, there we are, back again. The dip is fairly severe, so it completely disappeared. So that was my first observation. I thought, wow, that, that's great. Um, I wonder if that particular observation was of any use to anyone. Well, partly, yes. Um, I did try and get the times off it in a crude way, just by looking at the video uh, frames and the time code. Um, but there was another flaw in the system, which we'll look at later, and that was the fact that I was getting my time source from the internet. So the laptop clock was being um, updated over the internet, over the uh, NTP time protocol, and, and really that's not good enough. I mean, it's better than nothing, but uh, uh, for accurate work, um, you need something better. But, but nonetheless, that did appear on a result and it, and it wasn't too bad. It wasn't far off the mark actually. So that was very, a very pleasing introduction. Um, but what's the point of observing these? Um, okay, they're good to look at, quite fun. Um, well, the first thing is that timing the event accurately um, can for some objects give you uh, a position better than 10 to 100 times uh, what can otherwise be done which uh, is extremely accurate. Um, it's because of the, the very accurate positions we now know for the stars from the Gaia um, scheme and so on. And indeed, for these TNOs, trans-Neptunian objects, um, it's the only way of getting accurate um, information for uh, rendezvousing a spacecraft, uh, as happened um, in 2019 quite a, a well-known one, this um, object, then known as 2014 MU69, um, was targeted, uh, well, yes, was targeted by the New Horizons uh, spacecraft. And they really went to town with the preparation, 24 telescopes used over six months on various stars, and also the, the flying observatory. Uh, that must have been um, uh, quite a nice geometrical uh, problem because the, the, the observatory is also flying along at 500 miles an hour or something. So uh, that, that must have been an, an interesting calculation to, to get the exact times there. And here is um, the result of uh, that rendezvous, or one result. Um, it's now known as Ultima Tool, I think it's called, and it's uh, an interesting um, combination of two small asteroids which have bumped together and never moved apart again, um, being insufficiently massive to form its own spherical shape. Um, the size of an asteroid can be found from our timings and even 3D information as well, which is perhaps surprising, but uh, um, I'll show you how that works in a little while. Uh, here's another smallish uh, asteroid with a rather peculiar shape. Um, this asteroid, which is about only 400 meters long, I think, will come extremely close to the Earth in uh, 2029. Um, in fact, so close it dips inside the geostationary satellite orbits. That's really close. Um, I'm, I read that there isn't really much chance of it hitting the Earth, but um, obviously, the more we know about it and its orbit and its characteristics um, and other objects like, like it, the safer we will be, possibly, if we can do anything about it. Um, so, um, right. The size of the asteroid can be found. If we go back to the original um, slide there, you can see that um, because the light 
from the star, which is uh, a long way away, and the asteroid is as well, the light is effectively parallel. It means that the size of the shadow or the width of the shadow is roughly equal to the width of the asteroid. So if you have observers, as we have there, across the um, shadow, uh, hardly ever happens that they're in a straight line like that, dotted all over the place, um, then we know roughly what size the asteroid is. But of course, if it's a small asteroid, it will be spinning and tumbling. So it is only a, a kind of a snapshot of its, of its width or size at that particular time, but nonetheless, um, very useful. Um, Okay, how do we get the shape of the asteroid? Well, here's a good um, graphic by David Dunham, who's a well-known expert uh, in the States. Uh, in this case, we have the star off to the left, off the screen, the asteroid moving downwards, casting a, a shadow across, which runs across from uh, the States to Africa, and with five observers there. Now, from this, it looks like observers A and E won't see anything at all, but B, C, and D will see the star disappear for different amounts of time, depending on the width of the asteroid at that moment. Okay, you have to accept that this asteroid might be turning, but I don't think usually it's turning sufficiently fast to make too much of a difference to the, um, the outline of the shape as a snapshot. So if we go on a little bit further, this is an actual, um, uh, result. Um, and we have, uh, what is it, six observers there. Um, my result was the second from the top, which roughly seems to agree with everyone else. But you can see that even with just a few um, results, uh, you can start to get an outline for the asteroid. Now, of course, um, there's some clever calculation because you have to compensate for where the observers are um, along the path, not only from side to side, but actually along the path. Luckily for us, all the uh, calculations are done by somebody else, and these results just appear. Um, you can also see um, error bars um, on the ends of the timings. Um, it's, I'm not quite sure how the, these um, shapes are fitted. It's, it's at a very basic sort of stage there, but um, Nonetheless, that looks like a pretty good result as they go, from the ones I've seen anyway. Um, also, 3D information can be superimposed on that. Now, this is from a professional technique, mostly, um, which I won't talk much about, because I don't know much about it, to be honest. But um, uh, we'll, we'll have a little look at that later on, just a little bit anyway. Right, another point to observing these events, there is the possibility that you could discover a new moon or even rings or something else around an asteroid, um, in which case you might see two disappearances or a very short disappearance at the wrong time. Um, I'll show an example of that in a moment. Um, here is uh, um, Ida with a tiny moon called Dactyl good shot. And here is an actual result. Um, this was quite a big um, asteroid, Sylvia. And of course, it's the bigger uh, asteroids that do tend to have moons. Um, in this case, the, the, uh, the sense of the track has been like reversed or inverted. So, so it's the gaps that we're interested in here, not the actual um, uh, colored lines themselves. But you can see, although we've got a good result for nearly spherical Sylvia here, um, there are also two other very small disappearances of the star there and there, which I think was pretty lucky to get both of them uh, because who knows where they are when the asteroid is actually going to go across the star. It's luck as to whether um, you're going to see uh, any disappearance at all. They could be right up, up around the top or whatever, around the back of the asteroid. Um, what's even more extraordinary is, I think, I believe that this uh, result here, where the observer saw first one dis short disappearance and then the main disappearance, 
of the star was by someone doing their very first observation. They thought they'd have a go and they, they struck lucky, uh, hit the jackpot on the first outing with uh, quite an unusual observation. So uh, one asteroid and one moon. So very useful to start to work out um, orbits for the moons even. Okay, um, it is very rewarding to do these um, observations, knowing that, that some, it's of some use to someone. Um, occasionally we do get emails as well asking for a specific uh, asteroid or event to be targeted if at all possible. So you do feel you're part of some research in some sort of way. <coughs> um, all of the um, results are uh, held online and, uh, and are available for uh, the professionals um, to use as and when they need them. And last of all, of course, we touched on it, uh, you, you might make a name for yourself and discover something really unique and unusual. Okay, on to the actual observing of them. Um, this is my location in, in Hertfordshire. Um, uh, I do have the luxury of a, an observatory, it wasn't always so, and uh, a nice uh, site with a, a good horizon. And inside there uh, is my C14. Um, <coughs> uh, it's very advantageous to have um, a go-to mount, saves a lot of time finding your target stars. Um, especially when you don't want to hang around in the middle of the night. Um, you know, I've got it down to a reasonably fine art. I can, I can be up, out, observed and back within an hour, which I think is pretty good. Um, and so far, things haven't really let me down at all. Um, but it is much easier if you've got a go-to mount with a permanently aligned um, equatorial. That'll find it straight away. A good workhorse, the C14. The only thing I would say for this work, it's um, the focal length is a bit long, even with um, a reducer. The, the most I can get away with um, as a reducer, it's uh, the field of view is is not that great. But I mean, it's okay. You can get by. But uh, yeah, it makes finding things perhaps a little bit more difficult. But if it's all set up, it's absolutely no problem usually. Right. You need a camera, of course. Um, I had a couple of cameras. Um, they weren't absolutely um, suitable, but they, they, they were fine for the first observations that I made. Um, a reasonably good laptop. Uh, if you're using an analog uh, camera, such as a, a Watek 902, um, you'll need a, a capture card uh, or a way of record. I don't think many people record on videotape now. It used to happen on digital videotape some capture software. Now the one that's recommended uh, as being tested by uh, the people in the know um, is SharpCap. That's the most stable for timing. Uh, I personally, I've found FireCapture good as well, uh, but SharpCap, um, the um, author, I think his name is Robin Glover, um, fantastic bit of software and he's made efforts to, to make this a useful tool for recording um, you know, time critical events as well. And it's good if you re record in a format that has the time built into it as well. So not just a timestamp in the picture area, but actually the time code uh, embedded in the metadata of each frame. It's not the only format you can use. Okay, we touched on this, an accurate source of time um, and a way to set and maintain the laptop clock which isn't very good usually. Um, we're after millisecond accuracy, probably that's aiming a bit high but uh, for, the, for the total accuracy, but uh, well, some techniques are getting there actually. Okay, and now IOTA, the, the sort of governing body, um, has a, an aim of uh, timings to a tenth of a second or better. Uh, mostly it's better than that. The time where it's worse, is usually where you've got very faint events and you need a, a, um, a slow shutter speed or, or a long exposure so it's impossible to run the camera um, at that speed that you need to get that time resolution. 
Right, the camera choices. Uh, yeah, I mentioned you could use an, an analog video camera. And for a long time, this is what was thought of as being the best uh, sort of gold standard, most reliable way of doing it. Because um, with, a, with an analog timestamp inserter, before it got recorded, you could virtually guarantee once uh, you calculated any offset that it would be absolutely stable and um, give, give you accurate time stamps each and every time with no interruptions or, or um, you know, hiccups or anything. Um, so I think that, that attitude is dying away a bit now. I think most people realize you can do it in other ways because there are so many advantages to doing it in other ways. Uh, yeah, they can only run at normal video rates, which is uh, for, for the British uh, market, uh, 20 milliseconds or 40 milliseconds, um, depending if it's a field or, or a full frame. Or um, a digital camera. Well, CCDs are old hat now, we are told. <laughs> it's all CMOS in the future. Um, Unfortunately, not many of them are global shutter. Um, the one I have is, it's slightly unusual. That does help actually, because um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the way shutters work, but um, it does mean that for everything that happens in the frame of a global shutter camera, um, that was done at the same time. All the pixels were uh, exposed, if you like, at the same time. In a rolling shutter, that's not quite true. but but even so, uh, a rolling shutter is it's hardly going to give you much of uh, an error, probably a few, a couple of milliseconds at the most. So it's not really that much of an issue, especially if you use a small region of interest on the camera. Um, yeah, you just choose the bit that you need rather than the whole frame. And it's the height that's important, not the width. Um, yeah, the main advantage, they're, they're cheap. Um, the camera's relatively now. Uh, especially ZWO, fantastic cameras for, for the money. And um, other advantages, uh, binning, that's more applicable to CCDs really these days. But um, but yes, it, it is possible to, to have good sensitivity now with these cameras. The, the efficiency is extremely good. Right, now we're on to the, the reason why um, they weren't uh, taken up straight away. A lot of people uh, rightly in the early days pointed out that Windows operating systems aren't real time and that anything could happen at any time to the operating system to delay your video, delay the timestamp, do something else. Um, who knows, nothing could be proven to be accurate. And I think a lot of that was the in inadequacy of the hardware in the early days. They had inadequate uh, laptops and so on. Uh, but yes, it's still, possible that that could happen. So uh, we do try and take care with that. And, and if possible, I uh, have um, a way of uh, verifying that the timestamps that uh, we see on our frames are accurate, which is what I'll come on to. It's something uh, I've um, taken up myself. Um, yeah, you can mitigate this problem. But a way of avoiding it entirely is to use this camera which has um, a gps receiver built in and stamps the frame before it's sent off to the laptop so there's no possibility of windows altering anything because each frame already has its time code allocated so once that's calibrated that should be very accurate and they are turning out to be quite good or very good i would say they are expensive though. No doubt they'll come down in price uh, a, little, a little bit. I can't see them selling uh, thousands and thousands of these, but uh, yeah, I would think the cost should come down. I think the front end is basically the same as the camera I've got, the 174 um, chip. Okay, so I think we've already established really that the, the laptop clocks that we have uh, if you leave them uh, connected to the internet even, are, are not very accurate at all. And certainly disconnected from the internet, they're, they're absolutely terrible. My laptop will lose, I don't know, 30 seconds in a couple of days easily. Um, so it's, it's very, very bad. Um, so 
we, we need to do something about that. Yes, that's true. Um, and there's a very early source of uh, accurate source of local time. The GPS seems to be the favorite, of course. It's not the only solution. There are other solutions as well, uh, radio signals, for example. Um, but GPS is quite convenient and cheap these days. So this is the um, first um, sort of halfway decent, shall I call it, um, setup that I have or had um, after those first few observations where I just used the internet for time. Um, so the camera's just connected to the laptop as usual. And I have um, a little um, server uh, called the Leo NTP server, which has got a, a GPS built in. And uh, that sends uh, the usual NTP network time protocol signal to the laptop. Um, but of course, the difference is that it's not connected to the internet. So there's none of this problem with delays or anything else that happens on the internet. You've got absolutely raw, if I can call it that, uh, GPS uh, converted into an NTP uh, signal going into the laptop and updating the uh, um, the laptop clock via this uh, software called Mindberg, which seems to just sit there doing its own thing very nicely. The good thing about Mindberg is it actually logs the offset between the GPS time and the laptop clock time. And usually it's under half a millisecond. Uh, sometimes it's much less than that as well. So I can virtually say once this is settled down and been running for 10 minutes, maybe a bit longer, that the laptop clock is pretty much spot on. That's not the end of the problem though. We still got windows to deal with. Um, actually, I should say, first of all, that this wasn't the very first um, version. I actually used a Raspberry Pi uh, computer to do that job of the Leo NTP server. It had a little add-on GPS module and uh, my friend Jack Weber at Wellin helped me set that up. Um, he uses one, I think, for uh, amateur radio purposes. Uh, or oh, he's got one of the Leo NTPs now as well. So they, they, they do fire up and, and work flawlessly. Um, but, it, but yes, the Raspberry Pi also worked very well indeed. So that was a lower cost um, solution to begin with. Okay. Uh, right, just to underline the fact, here is, is a nice example of uh, a Windows interrupt. This poor lady um, was doing um, uh, a weather forecast live on an American uh, channel, and suddenly the, the computer decided that it would interrupt things and ask if they'd like to upgrade their operating system uh, right in the middle of the broadcast. So um, not a very welcome interruption and not much they could have done about it, to be honest. I mean, um, well, yes, perhaps some, some tweaks beforehand, but um, I'm sure some other things could have got in the way as well. Um, there we are. Things you can do, first of all, to reduce the possibility of um, uh, Windows spoiling things <laughs> is to use a well-resourced, a, a good modern laptop. It doesn't have to be the fastest gaming laptop ever made, just uh, a reasonably good one. And Windows 10 is a big improvement for time handling over all the other versions. Um, I don't know the technical details, but it, it's been overhauled and it is a superior system for, for handling time. Disconnect the laptop from the internet. No antivirus is needed. Um, any apps that you don't need, um, get rid of them. Uh, in fact, some people um, have a laptop with just sort of bare bones operating system, which they just keep for this sort of purpose. But I find my laptop, as long as I'm careful with it, I can use it for all sorts of other things as well. Um, yeah, change the capture program, in this case, SharpCap, which I use, um, change the priority to real time. Now, of course, it's not really real time. It just puts it at the very highest priority within Windows for um, action, as it were. Um, I, I was a bit dubious about doing this. Uh, first of all, I didn't know what else would happen if I did that, but Nothing has ever, ever happened when I've done that. And it always defaults back to normal priority whenever you reboot the computer. So 
um, I think that just reduces the chances of anything else um, happening uh, and putting the program, um, you know, in, in second place, as it were, uh, just for a, a split second. And also, um, yeah, good idea to have a look at the CPU when you're running at full tilt, you know, get the camera running at 200 frames a second, um, have a look at the CPU. It shouldn't really be much of an effort for the CPU itself. Mine generally is about under 20% when it's doing something like that. So there's plenty of um, um, scope for it to do other all, all the other uh, background things that it that you can't help but you know leave running. Um, but um, and this is where I've um, sort of uh, tried to um, get some way of. Um, well, firstly, um, people who criticize this sort of um, way of doing it, well, let's have a method that um, shows that these timestamps can be verified accurately, as near as possibly. Um, obviously, we don't want to involve the laptop or another computer, otherwise we've, we've just got the same thing going, uh, the same criticisms leveled at the, at the scheme. Um, so this is what I'm currently using. Um, it's a uh, something I've, I've sort of lashed up, but it does work effectively. Uh, it doesn't do the whole job, but it gets a long way there. Um, on the back of the Leo NTP server, there's a VNC connector that outputs this one pulse per second pulse, which is an extremely accurate pulse derived from the GPS. Uh, accuracy 30 nanoseconds. It's uh, <laughs> fantastically accurate. Um, and it's enough to drive a little LED. Um, and that LED will come on extremely quickly. They're, they're virtually instantaneous, the way they start producing light. And that has been fed to a uh, chip as it's recording. But you only get one flash a second, of course. So this is uh, my modified uh, 174 camera with the little box on the back with the gubbins. So it's still quite portable and yeah, it doesn't really affect handling the camera or anything like that. Um, yeah, and as I say, it inserts um, a little flash in the corner of the frame every second. So this, as the moment the light appears, that's the very start of the next whole second. Very, very accurate. So how it works is, the signal comes from the back of the uh, NTP box uh, and goes to an LED. There's a single optical fiber pointing at the LED. There's a brass microtube to support the fiber and it's all pointed at the corner of the sensor in the camera. Here's a cross section. Um, you can see that the fiber ends a little way up the brass tube and that acts as a sort of a baffle so that light doesn't splurge across the whole sensor. I mean, this, this idea isn't new really, um, but I think mostly it's been done with optics before, where uh, a small dot of light has been focused with lenses onto the sensor. But I think that's a, it's a lot more difficult to arrange. And also I think there's probably more of a chance of getting spill. And so you could get a very vague sort of flash across the whole sensor if you're not very careful, if the optics aren't superbly clean, etc. Um, anyway, I didn't try that. I tried this first of all, and it does seem to work quite well. Uh, so here is um, the inside of my camera. Um, the only hole I had to drill was this one to get the, the brass microtube into the camera. Uh, these holes here for the support bracket um, were already there. Careful not to use too long a screw and go right through the printed circuit board underneath. Um, not that I did that. And um, you can see that the, the optic, the optic fiber comes into the brass tube all the way down here and ends up very close to the chip there. Okay. Here's the inside of the box, rather Heath Robinson, but it works and it's been working for several years now. And it, it's a good job uh, as far as the function goes. <laughs> Not very pretty. Uh, anyway, 
this is the connector. It's an ordinary uh, phono connector, uh, a limiting resistor here, straight to the LED. No electronics involved. Okay. Now that LED shines. Hello, where's that gone? Here we are. Shines onto the fiber, which is there, which comes around here and into the brass tube and thence to the camera. Now this screw moves the spring in and out, the spring on which um, this is mounted. And that's my level control. It moves the end of the, tube, the fiber further away from the LED. And so the spot of light gets dimmer, or move it back again and it gets brighter. There are ways of controlling uh, LED brightness, but if that's done electronically, quite a few of them cause the LED to flicker or flash. So it's not a very good idea if you're, if you're trying to get accurate uh, timings to have the thing flashing or, or delayed in some way. So that's not possible with this system. Um, the LED is either on or it's, or it's off. Um, I think that's, yes, you, you could use a resistor, I think, but I think they only have a limited range of adjustment uh, with an LED. It's not quite as easy with, with, with resistors. Okay, just uh, some detail on how I made it. There was a, a piece of brass uh, with some solder. These were the components. Um, you can get the, the tube from model su supplies. And it happened to be, lucky coincidence, exactly the right size for this optic fiber. A nice sliding fit into the tube, very good. Okay, so this is what it looks like in, the, that's a full frame. So there is rather a big splodge in the bottom right hand side, but it doesn't spoil the rest of the frame. Uh, and there's more than enough area, of course, there to, to look at, uh, well, um, any star, any number of stars really uh, that you're interested in. Um, generally speaking, I, I use about half that area anyway as an ROI to save save on file size uh, and also give the system an easier time if it's running very, very fast. I can actually run this. It's not going to run at the right rate because I think it was recorded at an odd frame rate anyway, but um, <laughs> well, there we go. It looks a little bit odd, but um, that's the sort of thing you, you get. Uh, that was also quite slow as well. So we were seeing it possibly not every second because the, the uh, shutter speed was, wasn't allowing you to see that um, definition. Right, so, so that goes a long way towards verifying that your timestamps are right because you can check at the beginning of every second, you can set, check the interval between seconds. Um, so I think you can imagine how you'd do that. You'd, you'd get the frame where the uh, light from the LED is first seen, and then you check that that is actually the beginning of a second on the time code. And uh, Inver invariably it is. Um, I've hardly ever had anything go wrong with it. Um, there is a delay which you can allocate to a certain ROI in recording, uh, but you can take that as a constant error. It's usually about, uh, I think it's about 14 milliseconds uh, on the ROI that I use. So um, I take that into account, but always examine very carefully the video and the flashes to make sure that everything looks looks uh, as it should. Okay, so that's my little modification for, uh, you know, fen fending off the critics of digital technology uh, and hopefully producing a you know, useful, accurate uh, results. Um, okay, on to some uh, real sort of serious uh, observations. Um, this, this one was good. Um, you can get this sort of diagram quite easily on the predicting uh, software. Um, of course, it gives you a very uh, rough overview of what's happening, but it, it does look like an eclipse track, doesn't it? Uh, solar eclipse track, a bit long for that perhaps. Um, and this is back two years ago. Right. Now, Electra, um, already um, there was quite a lot of information on Electra. Um, but the idea, of course, was to uh, refine that knowledge and 
uh, add to it as well if possible. Um, yeah, interesting that uh, something of its composition uh, was already known as well. Uh, here's a rather bad picture. <laughs> Uh, sorry, sorry, European Southern Observatory, but uh, yeah, it looks like some sort of bad composite. But anyway, um, that's meant to be Electra, I think, and two little moons. A better one is here. This is from the Keck. Uh, and this is um, on the right, um, the result of the DAMIT modeling. The database of asteroid models from inversion techniques, which I'm not going to go into, but it's some very clever um, processing uh, with, with light and reflectance off the surface, I believe. But you can see that the, um, uh, the actual image on the left is uh, not particularly high resolution. So yes, it's, it's obviously a very clever technique. Right. Um, uh, there were nine observers, uh, six of which are here. Um, all the lines look rather confusing, um, but if I tell you that each black line is uh, where an observer is across the width of the path, it starts to make sense. The green line, which I, you can hardly see because uh, there are so many black lines, is the center of the track, the predicted track. Okay, And the two blue lines, one here and one here, are the edges of the predicted track. Um, now that's my telescope. Uh, where's, uh, hold on, where's my point here? And it does look like uh, I'm outside the predicted track. So in theory, um, you know, I shouldn't have been able to see this happen. But of course, as we know, it's it's always worth observing, um, even if you're just off the track, because the prediction may be wrong, and you may pick up something else. In any case, okay. So that was the observe the um, yeah the uh, British observers. Now, luckily, the, the track ran right down through France and right down through the length of Italy, which is quite good. And there's quite a lot of observers there willing to uh, have a look at this. And even more extraordinary, uh, the weather seemed to be good for most people, which is great. Um, these people, obviously a bit speculative on the outside here, but still, still worth doing. Uh, the software that uh, predicts these for your own location um, is or can be linked to the C2A planetarium software. I don't know if anyone uses that. It's very good. Um, perhaps not the most user friendly, but in this sense, it's really good. You just click on a button inside the, the uh, software that tells you when these things are going to happen. And it prepares for you a little map like this um, to your own specification. By that I mean I've chosen that it should um, be 40 minutes uh, across the field of view, which more or less uh, is what I have on the telescope. Um, and there we are. There's our target star in the middle. So get the camera the right way up, otherwise you'll never find it. <laughs> but you have all the other information that you need on, on the night here. It tells you that it's going to drop by 1.6 mag, which is quite a lot. It's not going to disappear, but that's a very noticeable drop all of a sudden, 1.6. Crumbs this curse is blowing. It's going to last for 20.5 seconds maximum. Uh, and the direction and the location you already will have known about. So uh, that's a, a very useful thing, which I always take out. Here is my actual uh, observation. Uh, so let's run it. The, the star that we're interested in is there. If I just run back to the pre, oh, sorry. Yeah, run back to the previous one. Uh, yeah, we got that triangle of stars, bright one there, and the two there. There we are, bright one. So it's that one there. So let's run that. Okay, it's been occulted, but you can still see something there. And in this case, we can still see the asteroid, which is reflecting some sunlight back. Obviously, it's really faint in comparison to the star. Uh, I forget exactly how long that was for me, but uh, uh, it was shorter than 20 and a half seconds, I'm sure, because I was at the edge for a start. Okay, and we've got um, 
a not particularly good light curve of this. You can see that it's the light blue one uh, running along there. Important to have these um, guide stars in as well, because um, actually during that observation, there was some cloud and you need these um, guide stars to calibrate your um, target light curve. Uh, without them, you don't know really what's happened on the light curve. So um, we'll look at a, a, a slightly clearer one in a moment. Uh, right, we sub submit a report, um, which is to a large extent uh, filled in automatically by the software with all the names and so on and the star, which is very handy, um, to the European sort of collecting uh, points where the calculations are done. And this is what came back a few days later. So we had loads of uh, chords across the uh, asteroid. Um, I think the one that I did here is here, rather, across one end. And uh, the reason I pointed out, I was pleased with this one. This is a fairly early one of mine. Um, the guy next to me, as it were, <laughs> Uh, the green trace there, he was using the, the analog camera with the analog timestamp and so on. And I was using a more modern sort of setup um, with Windows. And you can see that they compare very well. They're, they're absolutely identical, really. So I was pleased that that actually did come in because <laughs> uh, I know people look at these and that they're always uh, rightly um, out to criticize any possible errors that seem to be creeping in. Uh, because it's meant to be serious data, uh, so you know it, it does need to be um, uh, looked at carefully. And here is the uh, Dammit modeling uh, superimposed. Um, I'm not quite sure why that seems to be slightly wrong. It, it looks to me as though it would fit much better if it was um, clockwise by a few degrees, but um, but I'm sure there is a reason for that. It, it's possibly due to um, the prediction being on one and not the other. So yeah, I'm sure there is a good reason for that. Uh, by the way, a very useful um, observation was here. Someone saw an extremely short um, duration uh, occultation, which marked very nicely the, the very extreme end of Electra. It's a shame there wasn't one there. Okay, a lot of people there, Switzerland, France, Germany, Italy. Right, so in summary, um, yeah, it, it, it was a success, that one. A, ve a very good set of uh, observations, uh, quite, quite detailed, and uh, it's paid off. Um, we do need more information about asteroids, especially the ones that uh, could possibly put us in danger. Right, now, a, a little bit of a look at um, some of the software that can help analyze your observations. Um, here's just an example. This isn't an actual recording of an occultation. It's just a time lapse in which you can see both the star and the asteroid. So let's just uh, play that and uh, we'll just see the asteroid get slowly nearer the star and it goes a bit gray in the end because um, the sun came up inconveniently. But um, was there any sort of an occultation? Uh, it's difficult to tell really, isn't it? Um, uh, we do need help with some of these because they're, they're a bit in, in, in this indecisive, I should say. Um, and the software that uh, we use first and foremost is usually Tangra. It's really easy software to use. You load your video into Tangra you click on the stars that you want to uh, analyze. Um, usually you put the, um, uh, the target star in first and then the guide stars. You press go and it does the business and it comes out with a light curve um, for the whole event. Um, and here there's a fairly clear cut uh, occultation um, so no problems uh, with analyzing that one. You could actually analyze that just by looking at the video frames, but um, it's, it's not always as easy as that. In which case you might need the help of this 
extremely clever bit of software, which is a plugin to the previous software, which um, statistically analyzes the levels both before, during, and after the occultation and gives you results that are um, the most likely to be the correct um, values for uh, disappearance and reappearance. So really clever stuff. No problem for the uh, software to analyze that sort of uh, event. But what about this one? This is kind of all over the place, isn't it? The light curve, there's a lot of noise. And who's to say exactly where the disappearance or the reappearance occurred? You, you can guess, but this does a really good job of um, analyzing, as I say, the levels uh, either side and during the occultation. Um, to, to make the best um, judgment as to what the most likely um, uh, times in reality are. Right, um, where is all this information? What can you, uh, where can you look to find out? Well, the best thing to do is to download Occult Watcher, nothing to do with Halloween, um, but it's a great free program that you can personalize now, I am actually going to um, try and show you this. I wonder if it'll work. Yes, just about. Um, OK, this is a, a typical page from it. Now, with this software, a cult watcher, I've entered in my position. Um, what the faintest star I want to observe is, and a load of other things, the lowest elevation that I can cope with, and so on. Um, and it gives me a tailored list, which is updated, well, nearly every day. And um, therefore, you can pick and choose uh, which ones uh, are likely to uh, be of interest. Uh, the ones with the blue mark on the side are the ones that actually show uh, as a prediction for a true occultation. But you can see this one is, is particularly narrow. It's a very small asteroid. And although that's me in the middle there, Although I'm in the middle, um, that's only got a very low percentage, quite low, 7% of actually uh, uh, showing an occultation. But if I go back to the other one, uh, which, I, no, it's down the bottom, I know, Tokyo. Now you can see that this is almost guaranteed to happen, perhaps not where I am, I'm just outside again, but for you, um, if you, you're in the London area or North London area, I'll show you the details in a moment, uh, that would be absolutely guaranteed that you'd see an occ occultation there. And you've got all the um, data here about where it's going to be and the timings and so on. And uh, if you right click on that, you can go to C2A and make your little chart as well. So it's, it's really quite easy once you're into the, the swing of things to, to get ready for a likely event. Uh, right, so that is anything else I want to say on that. Uh, yeah, you've got um, web details of those charts with the observers as well. This is not showing all the other observers because um, this is not my main machine and uh, it doesn't sync across machines, unfortunately. So I'll get rid of that and go back here uh, and say yes. If you do want to have a look uh, at one of these events, just to see what, it, what, what it's like for real. Um, 9th of December, Tokyo occults this uh, star. The only downside to this one is that it's quite early in the morning, but uh, I'm sure we're all used to that sort of thing. Um, it's quite a bright star. You probably only need a small refract refractor to, to be able to see this. And um, it's a nice high elevation due south southeast something like that so pretty handy and there's a good drop so the star will virtually disappear five and a half mags and uh, as good duration four and a half seconds um, so all we need for that for a guaranteed observation is some clear sky which is more difficult to organize but uh, but that's the sort of um, process you go through to to choose which ones might be worth looking at So in summary, um, if you want to do something that you feel might be useful, um, well, there's lots of things you can do that are useful in astronomy, but certainly this is one of them. Uh, 
I found it quite satisfying. Uh, you need uh, a bit of uh, patience and application to get your, your setup going. But uh, most of the actual hardware you, you might well have already. So um, it's, it's quite doable, I would say. Um, and I think really that's where we end. Apart from some free software all available online. And of course, the BAA has got a terrific um, section to do with that run by Tim Haynes, who is very, very helpful getting uh, um, people new to this up and running. And uh, he kind of, yeah, he's, he's great. If you need a second opinion on something, very, very helpful. So I recommend the BAA uh, section uh, highly. And that's it. There we are. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that indeed. Um, very interesting and something certainly I've never come across before. Um, I've got a question actually. I, I, I'm going to cheat the system and ask you direct rather than do it on chat. But if anyone else has got questions, please feel free to stick a note on chat. But um, Simon, could you tell me um, approximately what's the smallest size of asteroid that you could uh, uh, find that would work on this type of uh, experiment? Um, yeah, it would only be like uh, in, the, in the region of uh, a couple of hundred meters wow. across. Oh yeah, really small ones, Kern. It's because, of course, the the, uh, the stars are virtually pinpoints, and so they even small asteroids subtend a, a, a slightly bigger size. Now, of course, when you get down to that size, the the events are likely to be really um, quick, so a fraction of a second, so half a second or less. Uh, and that really means you have to have a fairly bright star. Otherwise, you're not running the camera fast enough to see it. But certainly, it's a, it's a very sensitive uh, yeah, way of, uh, of, of uh, detecting these. Uh, we've had a question from uh, Ian Melville, and uh, I'll just read it out to you. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, Simon, but he says, fantastic talk, Simon. I've been wanting to get into occultation recording for a long time. I know Tim, and he has been very encouraging. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of detail in your talk tonight, and I'm sure those that are interested in doing that will, will actually follow up on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Great to hear. Yeah. 